Section 13 of Astounding Stories, 18th of June, 1931. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Hahn. The Earthman's Burden by R. F. Starzl, Part 1. Danny O'Lear was playing blackjack when the Colonel's orderly found him. He hastily buttoned his tunic, and in a few minutes, alert and very military, was standing at attention in the little office on the ground floor of the Denver IFP barracks. His swanky blue uniform fitted without a wrinkle. His little round skull cap was perched at the regulation angle. O'Lear, said the Colonel, they're having a little trouble at the Blue River Station, Mercury. Trouble? Uh huh, O'Lear said placidly. The Colonel looked him over. He saw a man past his first youth, thirty-five, possibly forty. O'Lear was well-knit, sandy-haired, not over five feet six inches in height. His hair was close-cropped, his features phlegmatic, his eyes a little blue with thick, short, light-coloured lashes, his teeth excellent. A scar, dead white on a brown cheekbone, was a reminder of an encounter with one of the numerous Saurians of Venus. I'm sending you, explained the colonel, because you're more experienced, and not like some of these kids, always spoiling for a fight. There's something queer about this affair. Moronis, factor of the Blue River Post, reports that his assistant has disappeared, vanished, simply gone. But only three months ago, the former factor, Morones, was his assistant, disappeared. No hide nor hair of him. Marones reported to the company, the Mercurian Trading Concession, and they called me. Something, they think, is rotten. Yes, sir. I guess I needn't tell you, the colonel went on, that you have to use tact. People don't seem to appreciate the force. What with the lousy politicians begrudging every cent we get, and a bunch of suspicious foreign powers afraid we'll get too good. Yeah, I know. Tact. That's my motto. No rough stuff. He saluted and turned on his heel. Just a minute, the colonel had arisen. He was a fine, ascetic type of man. He held out his hand. Goodbye, O'Lear. Watch yourself. When O'Lear had taken his matter-of-fact departure, the colonel ran his fingers through his whitening hair. In the past several months, he had sent five of his best men on dangerous missions, missions requiring tact, courage, and so it seemed, very much luck. And only two of the five had come back. In those days, the interplanetary flying police did not enjoy the tremendous prestige it does now. The mere presence of a member of the force is enough, in these humdrum days of interplanetary law and order, to quell the most serious disturbance anywhere in the solar system. But it was not always thus. This astounding prestige had to be earned with blood and courage, in many a desperate and lonely battle, and to be snatched from the dripping jaws of death. O'Lear checked over his flying ovoid, got his bearings from the port astronomer, set his coordinate navigator, and shoved off. Two weeks later, he plunged into the thick, misty atmosphere on the dark side of Mercury. Ancient astronomers had long suspected that Mercury always presented the same side to the Sun, though they were ignorant that the little planet had water and air. Its sunward side is a dreary, sterile, hot, and hostile desert. Its dark side is warm and humid, and resembles to some extent the better-known jungles and swamps of Venus, but it has a favoured belt, some hundreds of miles wide, around its equator, where the enormous sun stays perpetually in one spot on the horizon. Sunward is the blinding glare of the desert, on the dark side enormous banks of lowering clouds. On the dark margin of this belt are the ring storms, violent thunderstorms that never cease. They are the source of the mighty rivers which irrigate the tropical habitable belt and plunge out, boiling, far into the desert. O'Lear's little ship passed through the ring storms, and he did not take over the controls until he recognised the familiar mark of the trading company, a blue comet on the aluminium roof of one of the larger buildings. Visibility was good that day, but despite the unusual clarity of the atmosphere, there was a suggestion of the sinister about the lifeless scene the vast, irresistible river, the riotously coloured jungle roof. 
The vastness of nature dwarfed man's puny work. One horizon flashed incessantly with livid lightning. The other was one blinding blaze of the nearby sun. And almost lost below in the savage landscape was man's symbol of possession, a few metal sheds in a clear fenced space of a few acres. O'Lear cautiously checked speed, skimmed over the turbid surface of the great river, and set it down on the ground within the compound. With his pencil-like ray tube in his hand, he stepped out of the hatchway. A Mercurian native came out of the residence presently, his hands together in the peace sign. For the benefit of earth lovers, whose only knowledge of Mercury is derived from the teleview screen, it should be explained that Mercurians are not human, even if they do slightly resemble us. They hatch from eggs, pass one life phase as frog-like creatures in the rivers, and in the adult stage turn more human in appearance. But their skin remains green and fish belly white. There is no hair on their warty heads, their eyes have no lids, and have a peculiar dead staring look when they sleep, and they carry a peculiar fishy odour with them at all times. This Mercurian looked at O'Lear, seemingly without interest. Where is Marones? the officer inquired. Marones, the native piped in English. Inside, he busy. All right, I'm coming in. He busy. Yeah, move over. Though the native was a good six inches taller than O'Lear, he stepped aside when the officer pushed him. Men and Mercurians had a way of doing that when they looked into those colourless eyes. They were not as phlegmatic as the face. Marones was sitting in his office. Well, I'm here, O'Lear announced, helping himself to a chair. Yes, Sally, who invited you? O'Lear looked at the factor, levelly appraising him. A big man, fat but the fat well distributed. Satinine face, dark hair, dark and bristly beard. The kind that thrive where other men became weak and fever-ridden. Also to judge by his present appearance, an unpleasant companion and a nasty enemy. Don't see what difference it makes to you, Elia answered in his own good time, but the company invited me. They would, Marones growled. His eyes flicked to the door and quick as a cat, O'Lear leapt to one side, his ray pencil in his hand. Marones had not moved, and in the door stood the native, motionless and without expression. Marones laughed nastily. Kind of jumpy, eh? What is it, Nargul? Nargul burst into a burbling succession of native phrases which O'Lear had some difficulty following. Nargul wants to move your ship into one of the sheds, but the activator key's gone. Yeah, I know, O'Lear assented casually. I got it. Leave the ship till I get ready. Then I'll put it away. Get out, Nargle. The native hesitated. Then on the lift of Marone's eyebrows departed. O'Lear shifted a chair so that he could watch both Marone's and the door. He reopened the conversation easily. Well, we understand each other. You don't want me here, and I'm here. So what are you going to do about it? Marone's flushed. He struggled to keep his temper down. What do you want to know? What happened to the factor who was here before you? I don't know. The translucent wasn't coming in like it should. Samus went out into the jungle for a palaver with the chiefs and to find out why. And he didn't come back. You didn't find out where he went? I just told you, Marone said impatiently. He went out to see the native chiefs. Alone? Of course alone. There are only two of us earthmen here. Couldn't abandon this post to the Wogglies, could we? Not that it'd make much difference, except for Nargle. None'll come here. You never heard of him again? No, damn it, no. Say, didn't they have any dumber strappers around than you? I told you once, I tell you again. I never saw hide nor hair of him after that. All right, all right, Ali regarded Maroons placidly. And so you took the job of factor and radioed for an assistant. And when the assistant came, he disappeared. Maroons grunted. He went out to get acquainted with the country and didn't come back. O'Lear masked his close scrutiny of the factor under his idle and expressionless gaze. He was not ready to jump to the conclusion that Marone's uneasiness sprang from a sense of guilt. Guilty or not, he had a right to feel uneasy. The man would be dense, indeed, if he did not realise that he was in line for suspicion. And he did not look dense, indeed, he was obviously a shrewd character. Let me see your lucine. 
Moraine's rose. Despite his bulk, he stepped nimbly. He had the nimbleness of a Saturnian bear, which is great, as some of the early explorers learned to their dismay. That's the first sensible question you've asked, Moraine snorted. Take a look at our Lucene. Ha, huh, have a good look. He led the way across the compound, waved his hand before the door of a strongly built shed in a swift, definite combination, and the door opened, revealing the interior. He waved invitingly. You go first, Elia said. With a sneer, Marone stepped in. You're safe, boy. You're safe. Elia looked at the small pile on the floor in astonishment. Instead of the beautiful, semi-transparent chips of translucine, the dried sap of a Mercurian tree, which is invaluable to the world as the source of an unfailing cancer cure, there were only a few dirty, dried-up shavings, hardly worth shipping back to Earth for refining. The full significance of the affair began to dawn on the officer. The translucine trees grew only in this favoured section of Mercury, and the Earth Company had a monopoly of the entire supply. Justly, for only on Earth was cancer known, and it was on the increase. That small, almost useless pile on the floor connoted a terrible drug famine for the human race. Marone smiled, might have been a grin of satisfaction at Adelia's question. Is that all you've brought since the last freighter was here? It is, he replied. The last load went off six months ago, and this here shed should be full to the eaves. There'll be hell to pay. It may not be tactful, Odley remarked, but if you've got your takings cached away somewhere to hold up the earth for a big ransom, you'd better come across right now. You can't get by with it, fellow. You should have close to six million dollars worth of it, and you can't get away. You just can't. Marone's controlled his anger with an effort. Like any dumb strapper, you've got your mind made up, ain't you? Well, go ahead. Get something on me. Here, I was almost set to give you a lead that might get you somewhere. And you come along shooting off, trying to make out I stole the loosen and killed those two fellows, eh? Go ahead. Get something on me. But not on company grounds. You're leaving now. With that, he made a lunge at the officer, quite beside himself with rage. Aaliyah could have burnt him down, but he was far too experienced for such an amateurish trick. Instead, he ducked to evade Marone's blow, but the big man was as agile as a panther. In mid-air, so it seemed, he changed his direction of attack. The big fist swept downward, striking Aaliyah's head a glancing blow. But the men of the force have always been fighters, whatever their shortcomings as diplomats. Aaliyah countered with a strong right to the body, Thudding solidly for Marone's softness did not go far below the surface. The factor whirled instantly, but not quite fast enough to bar the door. Aaliyah was out, and inside his ship in a few seconds slamming the hatch. Tact, he grinned to himself, inserting the activator key. Tact is what a fella needs. The little space flyer shot aloft until the tiny figure of the factor stopped shaking its fists and entered the residence. The post had a flyer of its own, of course, but Marone's was too wise to use it in pursuit. Aaliyah considered what was best to do. Of course he could have placed Marone's under arrest. Could still do it, but that would not solve the mystery of the two deaths and the missing Lucene. If the choleric factor was really guilty of the crimes, it would be better to let him go his way in the hope that he would betray himself. Aaliyah regretted that he had not kept his tongue under closer curb, but there was no use regretting. Perhaps, after all, he ought to turn back to pump Marone's for some helpful information. His mind made up, he descended again until he was hovering a few feet up from the ground. Marone's, he called. Marone's. He held the hatch open. Marone's came to the door of the residence. He had a tube in his hand, a long-range weapon. Marone's, Ali declared pompously, I place you under arrest. The effect was instantaneous. Marones lifted the tube and a glimmering, iridescent beam sprang out. The ship was up and away in a second, lurching and shivering uncomfortably every time the beam struck it in its upward flight. A good few seconds continued impingement. But a miss is as good as a light year. Miles high, O'Lear looked into his talons. Marones had laid aside his tube and was working with an instrument, like a twin transit. Plotting the ship's course, naturally, Elias set his course for the Earth and kept on it for a good 24 hours. 
Marones, if he was still watching him, would think he'd gone back for reinforcements. Such an assumption would be incredible now, but that was before the IFP had achieved its present tremendous reputation. Beyond observation range, O'Lear curved back towards Mercury again and was almost inside its atmosphere when he made a discovery that caused him to lose for a moment his natural indifference and to clamp his jaws in anger. The current oxygen tank became empty and when he removed it from the rack and put in a new one, he found someone had let out all of this essential gas. The valve of every one of the spare tanks had been opened. Had O'Lear actually continued on his way to Earth, he would have perished miserably of suffocation long before he could have returned to the Mercurian atmosphere. The officer whistled tunelessly through his teeth as he considered this fact. The visibility was by this time normal, that is, so poor, it would have been possible to land very close to the trading station. O'Lear was taking no chances, however, and came down a good three Earth miles away. The egg-shaped hull sank through the glossy, brilliant treetops, through twisted vines, and was buried in the dank gloom of the jungle. Here it might remain hidden for a hundred years. The twilight of the jungle was almost darkness. Landmarks were not, but Elia made a few small, inconspicuous marks on trees with his knife until he came to an outcropping rock. He had noticed the scar-like white of it slashing through the jungle from the air and used it as a guide to direct his stealthy return to the trading post. His belt chronometer told him it would be about time for Marones to get up from his night's sleep. A little discreet observation might tell much. Long before he reached the compound, O'Lear heard the rushing of the Great Blue River in its headlong plunge to the corrosive heat of the desert, and then, through the mists, he glimpsed the white metal walls of the company's shed. He climbed a tree and for a long time watched patiently, lying prone on a limb. Blood-sucking insects tortured him and flat tree lice resembling discs with legs crawled over him inquisitively. O'Lear tolerated them with stoic indifference until at last his patience was rewarded. Morones was coming out of the compound. He was alone and obviously did not suspect that he was being watched, for he stepped out briskly. Once in the jungle, he walked even faster, watching out warily for the panther-like carnivora that were the most dangerous to man on Mercury. O'Lear shinned it to the ground and followed cautiously. Morones had his ray tube with him, and as any traveller in these jungles did, O'Lear could and did draw fast but a dead trader would be valueless to him in his investigation, so he stalked him with every faculty strained to maintain complete silence. Often in occasional clearings, where the brown darkness grew less, he had to grovel on the slimy ground, picking up large bacteria that could be seen with the naked eye, and which left tiny, festering red marks on the skin. Mercury has no snakes. The trader seemed to be heading for higher ground, for the path led ever upward, though not far from the tossing waters of the river, and then suddenly he disappeared. O'Lear did not immediately hurry after him. A canny fugitive, catching sight of his pursuer, might suddenly drop to the ground and squirm to the side of the trail, there to wait and catch his pursuer as he passed. So O'Lear sidled into the all but impenetrable underbush and slowly, with infinite caution, wormed his way along. End of section 13。section 14 of Astounding Stories, 18th of June, 1931. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Hahn. The Earthman's Burden by R. F. Starzl, Part 2 Presently he came to the little rise of ground where Morones had disappeared, but a painstaking search did not reveal the factor. There were, however, a number of other trails that joined the very faint trail he had been following, and now there was a well-defined track which continued to lead upward. With a grimace of disgust, O'Lear again plunged into the odorous underbrush and travelled parallel to the trail. It was well he did so, for several Mercurians passed swiftly intent, so it seemed, 
in answering a shrill call that at times came faintly to the ear. They carried slender spears. Several more Mercurians passed. The growth was thinning out, and Alia did not dare to proceed further. However, from his hiding place he could discern a number of irregular cave openings, apparently leading downward. They were apparently the entrances to one of the native cavern colonies, or possibly of a meeting place. No earthman had ever entered one, but it was thought they had underground openings into the river. As the cave openings were obviously natural, O'Lear conjectured that there might be others that were not used. After an anxious search, he found one, narrow and irregular, well hidden under the broad glossy leaves of some uncatalogued vegetation. As it showed no evidence of use, O'Lear unhesitatingly slid down into it. It was very narrow and irregular, so that often he was barely able to squeeze through. The roots of trees choked the passage for a dozen feet or so, requiring the vigorous use of a knife. Bathed in sweat, his uniform, a filthy mass of rags, O'Lear at last saw light. The passage ended abruptly near the roof of a large natural cavern. Lights glistened on stalactites, which cut off O'Lear's larger view, and voices came from below. By craning his neck, the officer could look between the pendant icicles of rock and see a fire burning on a huge oblong block of stone. Figures were sitting on the floor round this block, hundreds of Mercurians. The leaping flames made their white and green faces and bodies look frog-like and less human than usual. But the figure that dominated the whole assemblage, both by its own hugeness and the magnetic power that flowed from it, was not of a Mercury, but of Pluto. For the benefit of those who have never seen a stuffed Plutonian in our museums, and they are very rare, let me refer you to the pious books still to be found in ancient library collections. The ancients personified their fears and hates in a being they called the Devil. The resemblance between the Devil, of their imagination, and a Plutonian is really astounding. Horns, hoofs, tail. Almost to the smallest detail, the resemblance is there. Philosophers have written books on the coincidence, in appearance of the ancient devil, and the modern decadent Plutonians. The Plutonians were once numerous and far advanced in science, and no doubt they called on the earth many times in prehistoric days, and the so-called devil was a true picture of those vicious invaders, who are somewhat less human than usually portrayed. What was once classed as superstition was therefore a true racial memory. Long before our ancestors came out of their caves to build houses, the Plutonians had mastered interplanetary travel, only to forget the secret until human ingenuity should reveal it once more. The modern Plutonian in that dank cave was over ten feet tall, and it is easy to see why he dominated the assemblage. His black visage was set in an evil smile. His ebony body glistened in the firelight. He held a three-pronged spear in one hand and sat on a pile of rocks, a sort of rough throne, so that he towered magnificently above all others. He spoke the Mercurian language, although the liquid intonations came harshly from his sneering lips. Are ye assembled, frog folk, that ye may hear the decision of your thinking ones? he asked. A respectful peeping chorus signified assent, but in that there was a hint of unrest, even of fear. Speak ye, thinking one, your commands. Hear me first, an old Mercurian, unusually tall, faded and dry, looking his thick hide wrinkled like crushed leather, rose slowly to his feet and stepped before the oblong stone. His back was to the Plutonian, his face to the crescent of chiefs. The old wise one. A twittering murmur went around the assemblage. Hear the old wise one. My people, I like this not, began the ancient. The lords of the green star have dealt with us fairly. Each phase they have brought us the things we wanted. He touched his spear and a few gaudy ornaments on his otherwise naked body. In exchange for the worthless white sap of our trees, if we longer offend the lords of the green star... A raucous laugh interrupted the Mercurian's feeble voice, and it echoed eerily from the walls of the chamber. 
Valueless ye call the white sap, sneered the plutonian. Hear me. The sap you call valueless is dearer than life itself to the lords of the green star, for they are afflicted in great numbers with a stinking death they call cancer. It destroys their vitals and nothing, nothing in this broad universe can help them save this white sap ye give them. In your hands ye have the power to bring the proud lords of the green star to their knees. They would fill this chamber many times with their most priceless treasures for the sap ye give them so freely. Withhold the sap, and your thinking ones may go to the green star itself to rule over its lords. They are desperate. Their emissaries may even know beyond the way to beg your pleasure. Speak, thinking ones. Would ye not rule the green star? But the chiefs failed to become enthusiastic. One of them rose and addressed the plutonian. O lord of the outer orbit, for near one full phase have ye dwelt among us. And well should ye know we have no desire for conquest. We fear to go to the green star to rule. Then let me rule for ye, exclaimed the plutonium instantly. My brothers will abide with ye as your guests, shall see that ye receive a fair reward for the white sap, and I will convey your commands to the lords of the green star. The old wise one raised his withered hands so that the uncertain twittering of voices which followed the plutonian suggestion, subsided. My children, piped the feeble old voice, the black lord has spoken cunning words, but they are false. It is plain to see that he desires to rule the green star, and our welfare does not concern him. If so it be that the white sap is of great value to the lords of the green star, it is still of no value to us, and if the gifts they bring to us are of no value to them, they are dear to us. The plutonian sneered. Dearer than the paste of strange dreams? A startled hush fell among the assembled Mercurians. They looked guiltily at one another, avoiding the eyes of the old wise one. What is this? shrilled he, turning furiously to the plutonian. Have ye brought the paste of evil to our abode, knowing well the strict prescription of our tribe? Fool! Your death is upon ye! But the plutonian only grinned and spread his glistening black hands in a careless gesture. High overhead, peering through the stalactites, O'Lear instantly understood the plutonian's strange power. The paste of strange dreams, a fearsome narcotic of that far-swinging dark planet, more insidious and devastating than any drug ever produced on earth, it had wrought frightful havoc among many solar races. The earthmen had opened the lanes, broken the age-old barriers of distance, so that the harpies of evil could traffic their poison from planet to planet. So the paste of strange dreams was added to the earthman's burden. Seize him, the evil one, shrieked the old chief, but the Mercurians sat sullen and silent, and the Plutonian sneered. Finally one of the chiefs arose, and with an effort faced the old wise one and said, The strange dreams are dearer to us than all else. Do as he says. The piping voices rose in eager acclamation, but the old wise one held up his claws, waiting until silence returned. Wait, wait, before you commit this folly, hear the green star man. Many times has he demanded audience. Let him come in. It is not permitted, demurred one of the chiefs. Ye permitted this being of evil to enter. Let him enter also. He is in the outer chambers now, one of the guardsmen spoke. His face is like the center of a ringstorm. Let him enter. Marone strode into the room angrily. Blinded by the fire after the darkness of the antechambers, he did not at first see the plutonian. He strode up to the ancient chief and glared at him. Does the old wise one learn wisdom at last, he rasped. The ancient shrank away from him, as did the nearer of the lesser chiefs. The old wise one thinks less of his wisdom, he replied wearily. Behold, he pointed to the enthroned plutonian. Marone started. His hand flashed to his side and came away empty. Deft fingers had extracted his ray tube, but he was a man of courage. Never could it be said to his shame that an earthman cringed in the sight of lesser races. So it's you, my sooty friend, he snarled in English. 
the Plutonian accomplished linguist replied, As you see, you don't look very happy, Mr. Morones. Morones regarded him impassively, his eyes frosty. That explains everything, he said at last with cold deliberation. First Samus, then Boyd. Going to finish me next, I suppose. The Plutonian twisted the end of an eyebrow and smiled. Interested in them. What did you do with the bodies? The Plutonian jerked his thumb carelessly. The river you call the Blue is swift and deep, but before you follow them there is certain information I wish to get from you. Where is the soldier who came to visit you? A crafty light came into Marone's face. He is not far from here, waiting for me. O'Lear in his cramped hiding place could not help feeling a warm glow of admiration for Marone's nerve, because Marone's thought him well on his way to earth. Nargle, what did your master do with the visitor? Drove him back to the Green Star, Nargle said promptly. And the oxygen tanks, did you empty them? I let them hiss, Nargle's grin was sharkish. News to you, eh, Morones? Your officer's corpse has probably dropped into the sun by this time. Tell me, why did you drive him off? Morones sagged perceptively. To gain a little time, he said truthfully. I knew I should be blamed and ruined for life. I didn't know you were here, damn you. I hoped to get this mess with the natives straightened up before he'd come back with reinforcements. Yes, well, you owe some months of life already. Your presence here has been more or less embarrassing, but I had to let you live or I'd have the whole IFP here to investigate. Now that you've failed in keeping them from getting interested, you may do me one more service. The black giant grinned. I've often wondered at the Earthman's prestige all over the solar system. Even tonight, soft and helpless as you are, these natives fear you. You will, therefore be an object lesson in the helplessness of Earthmen. Morones was pale but courageous. With contempt in every line of him, he watched some of the less frightened chiefs, at the command of the plutonium, push aside some of the blazing blocks of fungus on the stone to make room for his body. At last he raised his hands. Frog folk, he cried, if you do this thing, the lords of the green stars will come and they will come with fires hotter than the sun. They will blast your rivers with a power greater than the thunder of the ring storms. They will fill your caves with a purple smoke that turns your bones to water. Shrill cries of fear almost drowned out his words. All the Mercurians had seen evidence of the dreadful power of the Earthmen. They began milling around, then stood rooted by the roar of the Plutonian's voice. Lies, lies, he bellowed. See, they are weak and egglets. He stepped down, picked Morones up by one shoulder and held him dangling, high above the heads of all. Morones clawed and tore at the broady arm. He made a ludicrous picture. Soon the simple natives made a sniffling sound of mirth, and the Plutonian, satisfied at last, set him down again. He tells truth. The old wise one had climbed to the top of the stone block, the lords of the green star have their power not in their bodies, but it is great. It is greater far than the frog folk. It is greater than the lords of the outer orbit. They will come, even as the surly one has said, and great shall be our sorrow. It is not yet too late. Release him, and deliver to him the white sap. Seize this evil one. The feeble, fickle minds were being swayed again. In a gust of impatience, the Plutonian stepped down, seized the old chief's skinny body in his great black hands, and snapped him in two. There was a tearing of tough cords and tissue, and the two halves fell into the fire. For an instant the Mercurians were stunned. Then some of them vented hissing sounds of rage, while others prostrated themselves on the floor. The black giant watched them narrowly for a moment, then turned his attention to Morones. He seized him by the arm and drew him slowly and irresistibly to him. The murder of the old wise one had been done so quickly that O'Lear was unable to prevent it. Had he been able to use his ray weapon, he could have burned the plutonium down, but it had been bent at one of the narrow turns of the crevice he had come down. 
The need for extreme lightness in weapons was rather overdone in those early days, and a little rough handling made them useless. So now O'Lear, weaponless except for the service knife at his belt, began the hazardous undertaking of climbing among the stalactites to a position approximately above the plutonian's head. The job required judgment. Some of the stone masses were insecurely anchored and would crash down at the lightest touch. Some were spaced so closely together that he could not get between them. Others were so far apart that it was difficult to get from one to another. Yet he made it somehow and unnoticed, for all eyes were turned on the tense drama being enacted below. From almost directly overhead he saw Marones being drawn upward. You saw, the Platonian was saying triumphantly in Mercurian, You saw me unmake your old fool, and now you will see that a lord of the green star is even softer, even weaker. Marones in that pitiless grass turned his face to the hateful grinning visage above him. In his last extremity, he was still angry. You devil, Moran shouted. You may murder me, but they'll get you. They'll get you. Who'll get me, said the plutonium purred silkily, deferring the pleasure of the kill for another moment. Moran's was having trouble with his breathing. His red face lolled from side to side. His eyes rolled in agony. Suddenly he saw O'Lear. Unbelievingly, he relaxed. I'm seeing things, he breathed. Who'll get me? persisted the plutonian, applying a little more pressure. The IFP, Marones gasped. Well, you little son of a gun, O'Lear thought, and then he jumped. He landed astraddle the neck of the plutonium, which almost like forking a horse. One brawny arm seized a horn, the other, with a lightning swift dart, brought the point of the long service knife to the pulsing black throat. Put him down, O'Lear spoke with a great pointed ear. Easy. Back on his feet, Marones began bellowing at the Mercurians. Utterly demoralised, they fled pell-mell. Marones came back. He said, nothing to tie him up with. That's all right, O'Lear replied studiously, keeping the knife point at exactly the right place. I'll ride him in. Get going. You and be tactful when you go through the door, or this sticker of mine might slip. With extreme care, the plutonian did exactly as O'Lear ordered him to. It was necessary to radio for one of the larger patrol ships to take O'Lear's enormous prisoner back to Earth for his trial. The officer testified, of course, and the plutonian was duly sentenced to death for the murder of the old Mercurian. Execution by dehydration was decreed, so that the body would be uninjured for scientific study and today it is considered one of the finest specimens extant. In his testimony, however, O'Lear so minimised his own connection with the case that he received no public recognition. It was not until some months afterwards, when Marones, on leave, rode back with a shipload of translucent, that the whole story came out, emphatically and profanely. O'Lear finally consented to speak a few words for the Telephoto News Company and he stepped off the little platform deferential hands tried to push him back. "'You haven't told them who you are,' protested the announcer. "'Give your name and rank.' "'Ah, they don't have to know that,' O'Lear rejoined, keeping on going. "'They know it's one of the force, and that's all they have to know. "'Besides, there's a blackjack game going on, "'and I'm losing money every minute I'm out of it.'" End of section 14